Well, good morning. So glad you're here, and uh, it's just great to worship together and to, and to be together this morning. And uh, if you have any sort of questions, if you're new, uh, the place I would direct you to start is whoever brought you, whoever invited you, talk to that person. They, they care enough about you to have you here with them. And uh, if you don't have someone that you can ask, then in the lobby where you just walked through is our new here uh, table and a place where uh, some of our great people on our team would just love to answer your questions, show you around, help you get connected. We have a gift for you. Uh, even if you've been here for a long time and you want to just figure something out, that's the place to do it. The other place to do it is on our app. You can download that. There's a Sunday button that has all kinds of stuff for today. Uh, if you're a volunteer, you can manage even your serving and, and check in and all that stuff's there. So please uh, take advantage of those resources, the table in the lobby, the app. Uh, and we're just, again... Uh, just so honored to have everyone. You may have noticed if you walked in uh, from this side of the building that we're doing a craft fair uh, this morning. There's a ton of great stuff out there. And that's to just create a lot of those partners are creating awareness and helping with our global engagement, our missionaries and local partners. And you'll get to meet some really cool people and help out some great causes at the same time. So check out the craft fair I saw some like Christmas stuff, so you can get ready for that. My wife was over there and told me I got to go pay for some things. So that's where I'll be afterwards. So uh, make sure you check that out. And uh, I also just want to give you a little bit of a heads up. Next week, so we've been doing for several weeks this series, Practices for Knowing God. And it's been awesome. And what Stephen's going to share this morning, I, I sat through first service. It was so impactful. I know you're going to benefit from it. Next week, we're going to pause for a couple of weeks and talk about something different. And then we're actually going to come back to this topic of practices for knowing God. Next week, I want to attempt to answer the question, why does Jesus care about my sex life? And after two weeks of that, you're all going to wish I started talking about money again. <laughs> but it's a really important conversation that we need to have from God's word. And, and I, I started this message uh, a couple weeks ago last Sunday night at the corner with the college students and just what God did I think in that conversation what he's doing in in our midst is something important to look at and it's going to be probably different than what you expect but I just want to tell you that for a couple reasons one you might know someone maybe your one is someone that you think would would want to hear that conversation and be a part of that so invite them the second thing is, don't bring your kids to church the next two weeks. All right? I'm not saying you can't come to church. You need to be here. But you need to take your kids over to our kids' ministry. They do a fantastic job each and every week. And uh, whatever line you want to draw on that age, that's up to you. I'm just going to be talking about sex for two weeks. So you've been warned. Okay. Uh, the other thing I want to say this morning is I want to thank you. For those of you who support our church financially, when you give, you do amazing things. And, and today, we're going to hear a little bit of an update from John Campbell and how he and his wife Casey for the last 13 years have been sent out. They were college students at NAU who connected through a Bible study and, and God did amazing things in that and their growth and their journey. They got married, moved to Sierra Leone soon after and have been doing incredible work providing water, planting churches. Uh, God has just done amazing things through that work. And it's because of us together doing that work. We're a part of God providing. You'll hear John talk about, I won't even tell you a number, lots of people drinking clean water and being able to hear the gospel because of it. Because you gave money. You were involved. You made connections and I just want to say thank you, because every time we do this, we do it together. And so as John comes and gives us an update, I just want to say thank you. And let's give him a warm welcome as he joins us. Good morning, Christchurch. Uh, every time I come, I always start out with how excited and happy we are to be here. For us, this is like coming home. Uh, like Chris said, uh, Casey and I... Um, met at the college ministry here and led the college ministry before we left. And this church uh, took a chance on us and sent us out into the mission field. So it's like coming home. It's awesome to see old friends uh, and meet new people as well as we come. So just thanks so much for having us. 
Um, and I wanted to share an exciting update about uh, the work that's been going on in Sierra Leone. We, we do church planting work, and we also use water kind of as a vehicle to also share the gospel. And um, about seven years ago, we changed um, a little bit our approach, and at the time, it seemed like a very small change. Um, we were a registered charity in Sierra Leone. We were drilling wells as a charity, and we saw just some, some gaps in, in this approach of charity. And um, one of the gaps is that we had um, wells, different things that would break down, the gifts that we had given that, uh, that weren't being maintained. Um, uh, another thing that happened was we had water systems that we were uh, actively running. We had staff, we had overhead costs, and started thinking about, we're going to have to fundraise for these things till Jesus comes back unless we change what we do. And so we, we changed to a business model, and um, it, there's been some really incredible impacts of this. Um, business is mission, running a, a Christian business that's intentional about the kingdom. And um, we piloted this idea, and when we first started, even charging the idea of people paying for water was like kind of not heard of and really counterculture and not politically um, uh, popular. And, uh, but we piloted this program, and, and some incredible things have happened. This model has now gone out to three other countries. Uh, it's being done in Ghana, Uganda, and Zambia. And uh, through this process, we're able to provide water sustainably so that if we leave, things still move. People still get water and still, people still get this message. We've re currently, we're providing water to about 250,000 people in Sierra Leone. And the other countries, thank you. And the other countries like Ghana are doing even more. They have entire districts that have access to clean water and the gospel message through this, this idea of Christian business. And um, the other thing that's really cool is that it's unlocked. Because it's actually a viable business, we're able to tithe towards our church planting efforts. We're funding a lot of our different church planting efforts through uh, business income. And it's unlocking donor funding is, is, is drying up. It's limited. And so people are actually investing in this business so that it can grow. And so what we've done over the last... Uh, say 10 years of water, we're going to be able to do in two, the next two years will double um, just because people are excited about, um, you know, this, uh, this idea of this exponential growth of both people getting water and, the, and kingdom work. And I want to say thank you to this church because you guys have been so influential in being able to make this stuff happen. Uh, we would not be in the field if it wasn't for this church um, believing in us and sending us out. Um, so I just want to say thank you. And if you don't know, this church is very, very mission-minded, both here in Flagstaff, regionally, and internationally. So it's just it's an awesome uh, body to be a part of. And I just want to pray and say thank you to the church this morning. Father, we thank you, God, for this, this body of believers, Father, uh, their faithfulness, God, the, bringing this, this, this small thing, God, and watching you multiply it for, for your kingdom, God. Um, I pray for every ministry that the church supports, God. I pray for faithfulness and good stewardship of the funds that, that come in, Father. I pray that you would just bless the, the harvest, Father, that each and every ministry would just um, work in such a way, God, that brings you glory. Um, so we just thank you so much for this church and the blessing that they are all over the world. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Steven. I'm part of the teaching team here at CCOF. Uh, we crossed a milestone this morning I want to tell you about. I was out in the, at the craft fair after the 8.30, and two different people came up to me and said, so when are you cutting your hair? <laughs> so I know we try to make this a judgment-free zone, but I felt that judgment <laughs> out there, man. So I guess if it gets to your shoulders, people start asking. I'll keep you posted. Uh, something you need to know about uh, me as we get into our time, uh, the sermon this morning, is that I am a to-do list person. And so I'm wondering if there's anybody else, if I'm alone in that. Does anybody else make, rely on to-do lists out there? Anyone else? All right. Yeah, it's about half of us, right? Um, okay, let's go a little deeper. How many of you who raised your hands have multiple to-do lists in multiple media, right? You've got it on your phone, you have it written down on an actual to-do list, and then you have it on the back of a receipt that you're going to throw away for sure and forget. Okay. All right, one deeper. Who 
no matter what task you do, if it wasn't on your to-do list, you put it on there after you did it and you cross it off. <laughs> Hallelujah. Those of you who don't do that, I will have a call to faith at the end of this. and <laughs> You can be converted. Um, okay, so we're in the middle of this series, Practices for Knowing God. And we've been, um, we've been showing you this concept every week, that the practices that we're talking about every week, the purpose of that is not to gain knowledge or even gain skill. It's not to know about God. It's to know God better. That relationship is greater than task. And this has been a really freeing and important statement for me as a to-do list guy as we have been going through these practices or disciplines, we sometimes call them. Because the danger of a series like this for me is that I will be sitting where you are and be thinking, great, just another thing to do. I know how to do things. Put it on my list, cross it off, forget about it. The thing is, the practices that we've been talking about so far in this series are not supposed to be to-do items. Some of the practices we've already talked about are reading the Bible or praying, serving, Sabbath. We still have more coming up. Generosity, listening to God, gratitude. These are not supposed to be reduced to just to-dos, like being diluted by or disappearing into the rest of our tasks, like you drive the kids to school, shovel the walk, read the Bible, get gas, make dinner. That's not how it's supposed to work. So that's one danger for me in a series like this. Another danger for me is that these practices would become just another reason to feel guilty if we don't do them right, or if we don't do them enough, or if we don't do them like other people do them. One time I was giving a sermon on campus. Um, my main job is I'm, I'm a campus minister all over the state of Arizona with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And so I was giving a sermon on campus about one of these practices, about reading the Bible. And I was done with it, and uh, this kid in a cowboy hat came up to me. Nothing against cowboy hats. I just remember this detail about this guy. And he comes up to me and kind of puffs out his chest, and he says, I get through the Bible, the entire Bible, once a year. And I was like, Okay, and I, I guess that wasn't the response he wanted. So <laughs> this is, he did this, I'm not kidding. He took two fingers like that and he goes to me, every year, <laughs> like he really wanted me to know <laughs> that he was awesome basically. And I was like, great job, dude, you did it. Not only uh, are you an amazing Christian, I guess I'm a bad one. That's how it felt in that, th at that point. He, he was pressuring me, I felt like, to be, to read and engage in these practices just like he was. Now, the weird thing that's happening in a conversation like that is I really love the practice of reading my Bible. I believe that scripture is the very breath of God, it says in 2 Timothy. It's alive, Hebrews 4. It lights my path, Psalm 119. Whenever I interact with the Bible or with scripture in a, in a practical way, I feel closer to Jesus. I feel closer to the person that Jesus wants me to be. I'm less likely to worry or lash out in anger or act in my own self-interest that day. I'm more of a non-anxious presence in other people's lives. I make better decisions in my relationships and work and family life, my finances. And if I am able to practice, really practice knowing God through the scripture, and do it every day or regularly, that makes for an amazing week for me and the people around me. So I love this practice, but a weird thing happens when it becomes this, just another to do or just another reason to feel guilty, all of those positive effects fall away. We do not want this series to be that for you. We don't want these practices that we've been talking about and will continue to talk about to feel unimportant enough to just put on your to-do list and forget. And neither do we want them to be so big and bulky and heavy that they become spiritual guilt trips for you. We really want this series to be a way for us to grasp 
and do this more. Know God and have that impact our lives. So here we are at the midpoint of our series. And we wanted to pause and just take a breath and consider again that these practices are supposed to be good. And there are ways to engage in them without going to either of those damaging places, to-dos or shame. What I've done this morning to really try to get us to embrace this truth is I have chosen one of the practices that we've already talked about, and I'm going to go a step deeper. I've already been saying what, it's, what it is a couple times this morning. I'm going to look again at reading the Bible, because I think for some reason, the practice of reading the Bible easily becomes, at least for me, one of those two things, either a to-do or a task, or something that I just feel like is too big, and I can't really do it right and so I just don't do it at all. I decided about a decade ago that there had to be a better way. I wanted to figure out a way to actually remember every day that engagement in Scripture was good. Good for me and good for the people around me when I did that. And so I worked really hard to find a way to change it up. And I found that way, and I would like to share it with you this morning as a way to offer some hope that with a little thought and creativity and purposefulness, we can take these practices out of the rote and out of the shame-ridden and into the realm of goodness. This might be, I was thinking about this, the most practical sermon I've ever preached here at CCOF because what I'm about to do is I'm about to teach you to do something. And so it's going to be less preaching this morning and more teaching. So I'm going to teach you a skill, and then 10 minutes before I would usually be done, I'm going to stop teaching because we're going to do it together. I asked Chris if this was okay. I have a captive audience. I was like, what if we just did something together? And so I'm going to teach you a different way to engage with Scripture, and then we're going to do it together. That's why you got this note card and this golf pencil as you came in. So... um, Uh, I'm actually going to pray before I do any of that because this is going to take a little focus this morning. And I know how it is on Sunday morning. Listen, I sit there three out of the four weeks of the month. Sometimes it's hard to focus, right? Sorry, Chris, nothing against you. But sometimes you're like, Sunday morning, you're not exactly there. I think that we really need, as I teach this skill and as we practice it together, we really need to be here. And so I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to help us be here this morning. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we are here physically, but I pray that we would be here spiritually, mentally, emotionally as well. Help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on knowing you. Help us to receive a new skill this morning, a new way maybe to engage in scripture that might help us know you even more. I pray that I would get out of the way as much as I can, that I would teach well and clearly, and that you would um, help us to encounter you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you ready? Stephen's simple daily way to engage in scripture without guilt. You ready for this? All right, it's a one, two, three, four, five step process. The first thing I do is I release the pressure. This is the most important piece for me as I engage in the practice of reading my Bible every day. I need to release any and all expectations that others have put on me around Bible reading. I need to put Cowboy Hat Kid and others like him out of my mind. I need to be okay with how fast or slow I'm going and not feel guilty about that because others have told me I'm supposed to do such and such in such and such amount of time. I also need to put away any pressure that I've put on myself. Growing up in the church, I'm a pastor's kid. There's all sorts of pressures that have kind of come into me that I've put on myself. There was this pressure that I felt um, when I was a young person, especially like, 
man, I better read through the Bible before I die. I got an, for some reason, this is a big deal. What if I get to heaven and St. Peter's like, you didn't get through the whole thing? You're out. Like there was this pressure. No, it doesn't say that anywhere in the scripture that you have to read the whole thing, uh, that I need to actually think about every verse and numbers and really understand it. Now, should you read through the Bible? The, sure. But I have put so much pressure on myself that it, was, it had become like a salvation issue. It's not. And I need to release the pressure to do a speedy, rushed job with getting through the Bible. So that's the first thing I needed to do. And I would suggest, especially to um, maybe some of the middle-aged folks in the room, let's just let me say this to you. Maybe you've been a Christian for 10, 20, 30 years. Sometimes the way that we interacted and practiced these things when we were young don't work anymore. And I felt guilty for a long time about that until somebody told me, what if that's an invitation from Jesus to do something different, to go a little deeper, to, to experience him in a different way? And so if you're feeling like your practices of especially reading the Bible have gotten stale, don't beat yourself up about that. Maybe Jesus is inviting you into something different and maybe he's even doing that this morning. Okay, so I released the pressure and I would encourage you to do the same. The second thing is I devote some time. This may sound self-explanatory to you, but so many of us don't do this. This practice of reading the scripture every day that I'm about to tell you takes time. I think it, it, I usually take 15 to 30 minutes every morning to do this. Now, some of you are like, great, I can do that. And some of you think I'm insane to suggest that you find 15 or 30 minutes in your day. And I understand that. I, I know that we're all in different contexts. I think especially maybe of like uh, parents of young kids. When I say, just find another half an hour in your day, you wanna come up on the stage and punch me in the face. <laughs> like, how are we supposed to do that? Okay, so I get that there are different contexts in the room, but I think most of us have 15 or 30 minutes that we can find. I just want to humbly and gently remind you of my last sermon where I pointed out that the average American spends five hours on their phone a day. Lots of us have 15 minutes. Lots of us have 30 minutes. We just don't use them for this kind of thing. I wanna encourage you to take some time in the morning. And that's another thing I wanna point out here. I've tried a lot of different times of the day afternoon and evenings, there is not a time that I have found that's better than the morning for me, which means waking up a little earlier. But a lot of us can do that. But for me, the morning is best, and I want to tell you why. The process of reading Scripture, engaging with the Bible every morning, tunes me like a guitar. I asked Dennis to leave his guitar out here so I could just point at it. A guitar, like any stringed instrument, between uses, it goes out of tune. So every one of these strings, when it's, there's changes in atmosphere, in temperature, maybe somebody knocks into it, maybe some prankster comes. <laughs> I, I told Dennis, I'm, uh, his G-string is out of tune right now. I, I tell him that afterwards, okay? So... Somebody does that, right? And the, the guitar gets out of tune. And so before Dennis plays, leads worship on a Sunday morning, he has to tune the guitar, okay? Note that word b before. My, my friends last night went to the U2 concert in Vegas at the Sphere. They said it was amazing. My guess is that The Edge did not tune his guitar after the show. He tuned it before the show or else it would be a disaster. If I don't allow God to tune me in the morning, before the day, I'm kind of a disaster. And I've just learned over the years, I need to start. I need to devote time in the morning, 15 to 30 minutes, so that Jesus can tune me. And I want to encourage you, if you want to try this, 
to make some moves to make this possible. Okay, then I do something. Here's what I do. You ready? I start reading, and then I stop. That's what I do. Let me pick that apart a little bit. I start reading. What do I start reading? I found that it's the Bible. <laughs> Thank you. Man, you could give this sermon. Okay, so I, what I don't do is random verses. Like pick and choose, open my Bible. You know, sometimes you're like, what do you have for me? Okay, read that, right? I don't do that. I like to pick a book and read through it and get in me the whole story in context. Usually when somebody's trying this for the first time, I suggest that they start with Mark, the book of Mark, or the book of Luke. Because those are easy to read, they're narrative-based, they're rich with the life and teachings of Jesus himself. It doesn't have to be that, remember. Release the pressure. I've read a, a gamut of books like the Gospels or the Epistles, Psalms, Proverbs. The key is I pick something and I stick with it. Okay, so I've picked a book, and then I start reading. Then I stop. What does that mean? I read, here's the key, I read until something stands out to me. I read until something pops. I read until something grabs my attention. And then when that happens, I stop. This is a practice, actually, of trusting God and trusting myself to inter be interacting with God as I read, and trust him to draw my attention to something specific in the scripture. I don't have to know why that has happened. Not yet. That comes later. At this point, I just have to recognize when a particular word or sentence, phrase, or story stands out to me. And then that's all the reading that I do that day. If I sense that it may be something God wants me to pay attention to or something that for some reason I need that morning, I trust him and I stop and that's all the reading that I do that day. Sometimes I've read a whole chapter. That's very rare that I get through that much scripture in a morning. Usually it's a paragraph. Sometimes it's a sentence and I stop. The key here, again, is to release that pressure do not rush through. Hurry and rush is the killer of this process for me. Okay, so something has grabbed my attention and I've stopped reading. The next thing I do is I write it down. Whatever it was that grabbed my attention, I write it down. And I'm talking here about something that you can hold in both hands. So probably not a golf pencil, unless you're golfing when you're doing this, maybe you have that in your hand, and probably not a note card. This is just for this morning. I have a journal so that I can have all this in one place, but it's a physical writing utensil on paper. Washington University psychology professors did a study uh, recently where uh, they found out that students who just read something or just hear a lecture like you're hearing right now, forget everything they heard or read in an hour. So that's hard for me to confess to you in front as a preacher and teacher, but I just know that, that most of what I'm saying this morning, you're not really gonna retain if all you do is listen. It helped a little bit when students took notes digitally on their phone or on their laptop. It helped a little bit, but not much. Unless a test was given within 24 hours, all of that information was also lost. But if students wrote down notes, if they took notes with a pen and a piece of paper, those students not only retained but integrated that information for a week. It's really weird because I couldn't find out why. No, none, none of these psychologists know why that's so different. All they know is that it is. And so for me, when something, this process, this section is really important. I, I get it. It's already written down in the Bible. But I write it down also so that it starts taking effect in my own life. It starts entering in 
to my mind and my heart. Okay, so something has stood out to me. I've written it down. I don't know why yet. And so this final stage is the most important for me. I ask, so what? Why? Why, Jesus, did you draw this piece of scripture to my attention? What's the deal? Why this thing? How does it relate to my life? How does it relate to the way I'm living right now? How can I apply this to the way I live or I'm going to live today or this coming week? And then I imagine, I use my imagination, I use my mind to imagine what, what might he say to me about this if he was in the room, which he is, and speaking to me about this thing that has drawn my attention. I ask, so what? What does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with me? And I spend five, ten minutes just journaling about that and writing it down. We're going to do this together right now. I have you for 12 more minutes. You, you don't have any other plans, I'm assuming, for the next 12 minutes. And so we're going to do this. And so I've done the first two th for you. I've just released the pressure. I am not going to collect these note cards at the end and read them out loud, just so you know. And I've devoted the time for you. We've got the time here. And so we're about to do this together. Before we do, I just want to give you a practical example how this played out in my life this past week. So you get a little bit more of an idea of what this looks like. I was reading through Luke. I am reading through Luke right now as a part of this process. Stephen's simple, shame-free way of engaging in the scripture every day. That's my simple term for how this works. Okay, it's reading through Luke 17 this past week. And I get to this story about Jesus and he heals 10 guys at once of leprosy. And that's a really interesting story. I'm like, okay, I like this story, but nothing is really standing out to me about it yet. Nothing's popping. Nothing really seems to be relating to me or my life. I'm not healing leprosy-bound folks, not, certainly not 10 at a time. So it's, it's good to, engage, it, to be in the scripture around that, but nothing is really standing out to me. But then this one guy comes back to say thank you to Jesus. It says in verse 16, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then Jesus honors him for that. And something pops. My attention is drawn to that sentence. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. So I pay attention to that and I write it down. And I start thinking about why? Why? Is Jesus drawing me to that sentence? So what? What does that have to do with me? I start journaling about it. And I start thinking about how I usually live, which is just kind of like shrugging through life when it comes to what Jesus is doing around me. The amazing things that I'm sure he's doing in my midst, I just don't notice them. And I certainly don't thank him for that. So I'm journaling and thinking more and more deeply about that. And I get to thinking, how can I apply this? And so what I did was I got out of my chair and I laid down on the ground. I threw myself at Jesus' feet. And I spent five minutes thanking God for the things that he's done in my life. It turned out there were a ton of things. And I had this deep, intimate, special moment with Jesus that changed the course of my day, changed the course of my week, my month, I'm assuming. It's impacted me since then. And that's because I released the pressure. I took some time. I took my time. I went slow. I trusted God to bring something to my attention. And then I let it affect my life. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to take that golf pencil and that note card. If you don't have one, can you just put your hand up and one of the ushers will come and give you one? I would love it if everybody actually did this with me. So you could do a lot of things. You could totally check out for the next 10 minutes. I get it. I want to encourage you, for the next 10 minutes, don't touch your phone. Okay? <laughs> no. 
Put it far enough away from you or give it to somebody else. Don't touch your phone for the next 10 minutes. I want to really encourage you to try this. The, the worst that can happen is it's boring for you. The best that can happen is you actually have an experience with God in the next 10 minutes. And so I would love you to try this with me. I'm going to read this out loud to you, Psalm 23. A familiar scripture maybe to some of you, and that's okay. I'm going to read it. What I'm going to ask of you is to just pay attention to what piece of this scripture is most interesting to you. That's going to be the first read through. What's the most interesting to you? I'm going to pause and then I'm going to read it again. And I want you to pay even better attention the second time. What is drawing your attention? What word, sentence, or phrase? might God be drawing your specific attention to? Something else that happened out in the craft fair was I just asked people, what was the thing? I asked 12 people, 12 different answers, which means it worked because I got out of the way and I just let Jesus speak to people and he did. And so I have faith that that's gonna happen again in this service. As much as you can, can you just get comfortable in your chair? And I'm going to pray as we move into this time. Jesus, right now, this is, now it's out of my hands. I've preached what I can preach. I've teached what I can teach. And now we're faced with your scripture, your breath, your light, your word. My desire is that people hear from you. Would you release any pressure off of us right now as we've devoted time to you? Would you speak? Amen. I'm going to read this to you. What draws your attention the most? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just take it in, look at it. What, what sentence, what phrase, maybe it's a word, is piquing your interest the most? What might God be drawing your attention to in this passage? I'm going to read it again as I do. Start asking why. Start asking the so what question. As you see what's drawn your attention, again in context, start the process of asking Jesus, why might that be? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Okay. 
we've read. I've asked you to pay attention to maybe where Jesus wanted you to stop and pay attention. Now, write it down. So take that note card, put it in your palm like that. Take your golf pencil. What is the sentence, word, or phrase that stood out to you? Write that down right now on the top of your note card. And now I'm going to give you two minutes. That's going to feel like a long time when we're all together like this. To start asking Jesus why and writing down what you sense might be the answer. So what? What does this mean? What might this mean to me? How might you be drawing me into a response here? Just spend some time trying to answer that question. So what? I trust that many of you are hearing something from him or sensing something from him as you write. This is a quiet process, right? He speaks in a whisper. And so maybe you're not feeling the highest spiritual high you've ever felt. That's okay. I would encourage you to stick this in your back pocket um, or in your purse or in your Bible and look at it again today sometime. He may be starting a work in you right now that he wants to continue as the day goes on. I also want to challenge you to try this again tomorrow morning, to start a rhythm in your life of doing this. The reason I think that's so important is I think what just happened is a big deal. A picture is worth a thousand words, right? I think one moment with the spirit where he's actually talking to you is worth a thousand sermons. You are going to retain that. That is going to impact your life. It's a personal thing for you. And it's a beautiful thing for you. Speed is not the goal. Quantity is not the goal. It takes me a long time to get through one book of the Bible doing this. The first, th- the first book I ever did was Matthew. It took me a year. A year of my life. I don't have many left. Right? St. Peter is watching, right? No, I took a year. I took my time. I was in the Sermon on the Mount for almost four months. When I hit Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, come to me all you who are weary. He kept me there for three weeks. That's not a brag. In fact, it's not very impressive. I don't care. I'm not in a hurry. I wasn't then, I'm not now. I, I, I want this. I want this. I want to know God. And this is a way that I have found to engage in Scripture that gets me to that place. It takes away pressure and comparison and rush from this practice 
of knowing God. It's supposed to be good. And it's okay to want it to be good. Not a to-do, not guilt or shame-laden, but good. I hope this helped this morning. I'm going to pray. So the final thing I actually do in this process is I pray that it would actually have an effect in my life. And I'm going to pray that over you before we go this morning. Would you join me? Jesus, whatever you said, whatever it was to each individual in this room, let it be so. Let it have an effect in their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are real. Thank you, Jesus, that you are present. Thank you, God, that you are close. I pray that we would go different than we came in because we had an experience with you this morning. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, have a great time at the craft fair. Have a great Sunday. Let's go help one another follow Jesus.